Welcome everyone. Ni hao, guten tag. Bonjour à tous. Dear Jean Jouzel, dear Philippe Croison, our two honorary president, dear Christophe Poinçon, deputy CEO and scientific director of BRGM, our institutional partner and sponsor, and today our distinguished host. Dear sponsor MC2, Club CO2, B Zero Carbon and Trust by Trustco by SNPs. Dear partners, French Academy of Technologies and all academicians, the Carbon Disclosure Project and the IFP Energy Nouvelle. Dear audiences, I'm Fabrice Sang, the founder of Climate Tech Venture and the co-chair of this CPC Carbon Pricing Conference. And I've got the great, great pleasure to have with me Dr. Isabel chanikowski loriel Chief Research and Public Officer by BRGM. On these two special days, the 2 and 3 June, as a very mix of roundtables, keynotes, fire chat, and indeed startup highlighting, dedicated to the why, involving in the global model transformation from a new carbon-based model and how designing the future, how better understanding this net zero era to a better engagement beyond all the pledges. Supporting climate tech solutions also is a key point that we are going to address. And we will close the conference by a very special session, the Climate Tech Awards, a dedicated one to design the too early stage, but promising one to support and accelerate. You're already more than 8,500 people who follow us in the LinkedIn link today. And we expected to tell it transparently, just 1,000 people. So we are very impressed and grateful that you are pushed in an incredibly way the number of your attention. Much more than eight times expected, you're right, indeed, because this topic drives all of us and concerns all of us. From you, all around the world. Like a little village in this live stream, connected by this. We are here based in Paris, five years ago, after the Paris Agreement itself. And we want to synchronize much more than your time attention today. When it comes with climate and carbon issue, all of us have seen the series of pledges to be net zero. But indeed, in this net zero race, it's like an open hackathon. Let's do, say it like a marathon, where organizations, public and private, countries themselves are already planning a very ambitious new trajectory for the climate mitigation. By saying this, we, all of us, small and great actors, we should change our model. We should change our habits in this fast track modus operandi, unexpected just one generation ago. And today, we have to make it just in one generation also. Then, to co-design it, we are very grateful for our two champions, let's say, like this, for sustainability. Professor Jean Jouzel, former IPCC vice chair and academician, as a scientific pioneer with Professor Claude Lowis, have the inspiration just to have a look on the polar ice studies and highlight the natural data center of the climate and have paved the way also to contribute to the Paris Agreement much more than decades ago. We would like also to, to thanks very much Philippe Croison, adventurer, 
author, entrepreneur of life, and advocate today to a more resilient and low carbon models. Pushing the limit to highlight for the world and for the humanity and inspire us. Our also relevant editorial and scientific committee have powered this program by their inputs to prepare all the sessions. It is for you. And we are also gr grateful for our diverse lineup of speakers, from international to national representatives and experts from finance, from energy industries, from environment, public policies, and indeed entrepreneurs. And from different regions from the world, as you, the audiences. But before starting this CPC, Carbon Pricing Conference, I would like again to make a great thanks to our sponsor, in particular, the BRGM, where we are today, MC2, Club CO2, B0 Carbon, and True Cost by SP. And for our partners, the French Academy of Technology, the Carbon Disclosure Project, and EFP Energy Nouvelle. Thanks all of us for joining this fantastic and running project. From this framework, we are designing the CPC Carbon Pricing Conference like a milestone today to de dedicated to climate and carbon issues and to try to provide you a piece of work preparing Glasgow in next November for the COP26. And we'll address at the end of these two days to Alec Charma, the chairman of Glasgow, COP26, and his steering committee, all our key points that we are going to highlight in all round tables and keynotes. Let's join forth for this contribution. But before starting, I would like the floor to Dr. Isabel Chanikowski Loyal, my co chair for a real complimentary open message. And I'm very pleased, Isabel. Thank you, Fabrice. Slide number five, please. Welcome to everybody. I am Isabel Chanirovsky Loriol, co chair of the conference with Fabrice. I belong to BRGM, the French Geological Survey. BRGM is a part of the conference and is very pleased to host the conference in, from its offices in Paris, close to the Eiffel Tower and the Seine River. As said by Fabrice, I met him by chance at a research and innovation event in Paris. We are both very motivated to help bring everyone together and converge on solutions to effectively achieve carbon neutrality and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Beyond pledges, we need now actions. There is no planet B. We have to imagine planet A prime. We were delighted to organize this conference together, step by step, taking advantage of our complementary backgrounds. Startup, public research institute, fintechs and climate techs, male and female. I am a research and public policy chief officer. I've been carrying out research into underground technologies for climate change mitigation, starting with geothermal energy, then specializing on CO2 capture and geological storage, the CCS technology. There will be a dedicated session 2.3 tomorrow. I've been also involved in the underground storage of energy. To face the climate change crisis, I would like to insist on three points. First, I believe that new technologies are key to face the climate issue. It is crucial to increase support for research and innovation on all technologies that can contribute to ensure carbon neutrality. The good news is that we have a wide set of innovative technologies that are emerging, and some are already ready to be tested and implemented. For each territory, we have to investigate with the local stakeholders the best combinations of technologies and solutions. 
that are adapted to the specificities and the needs of the territory. They should be efficient, cost-effective, desirable, and deployed on time, at the scale needed, and as soon as possible. I am particularly looking forward to the Climate Tech Award ceremony, closing the conference tomorrow under the honorary presidency of Philippe Croison. Philippe has done amazing sporting exploits and is an example of how to surpass oneself and collectively under very difficult circumstances. Second, public policies are also key. I wish to remind the words of Mariana Mazzucato, who is professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London. In her bestseller book, The Entrepreneurial State, she explains how the state has played a central role in producing game-changing breakthrough, especially by actively investing in new high-risk technologies and sectors that private investors only later find the courage to move into. She stresses that such role of the state is needed for the green revolution and for facing the climate issue, and that it must be accompanied by symbiotic public-private partnerships. Third, adequate financial tools and market mechanisms are needed to accompany the public policy and enable the rapid development, scale-up and deployment of innovative climate technologies. The three pillars, finance, climate tax and public policies, will be discussed during the conference with outstanding speakers from all over the world. Fabrice and myself wish to thank sincerely all the speakers for their involvement and all the attendees too. We believe that this conference will be an excellent way to share the current status of knowledge and how-how, and we hope that it will inspire us all together for our next actions, whatever our job and as citizen. The convergence of all goodwill is necessary to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C by acting now, all together, globally and locally, coherently, and with determination. So now, I am very pleased to introduce uh, our honorary president of the Carbon, Cap Carbon Pricing Conference, Jean Jouzet, who is a famous French climatologist as a member of the French, European, and US Academies of Science. He was vice chair of one working group of the Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change when IPCC received the Nobel Prize for Peace in 2007, along with US former Vice President Al Gore. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to say a few words at the opening of this uh, carbon pricing conference. Um, uh, why it, uh, which for me is very important because, um, as uh, you know, I am a former uh, vice chair of IPCC Group 1 and uh, very interested in the, the challenge uh, posed by your uh, this uh, need to uh, clearly uh, uh, limit uh, of the global warming. And um, I really adhere uh, fully to um, the objective of uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C with respect to uh, pre-industrial. And um, uh, to the, this is uh, in the Paris Agreement, which uh, states that uh, the objective should be uh, to limit the global warming to well beyond 2 degrees C, and if possible, around 1.5 degrees C. And uh, it's clear that we are not far from uh, 1.5 degrees C because uh, the last uh, six years have been uh, very warm, the warmest uh, that we have um, known. Um, since uh, the last century, I mean, over the last, uh, the last 120,000 years, since the uh, beginning of the last century. And uh, uh, it's clearly, when we look at uh, what is a necessary condition to uh, achieve this goal, to which I adhere, because it's the only way to uh, make uh, 
life easy for for young generation uh, it's clearly necessary in this case to have uh, carbon neutrality uh, around 2050 and um, this was uh, really a key result of uh, the uh, last uh, ipcc special report on uh, 1.5 degrees c uh, and uh, in this report uh, uh, four uh, scenarios are uh, presented to uh, which are compatible with this uh, objective but the most ambitious uh, scenario is uh, is really uh, 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 without uh, overshoot which is very important and um, in this case uh, we we need really carbon neutrality 2050 and uh, this uh, carbon neutrality in this scenario, which are uh, discussed in this IPCC uh, special report, uh, uh, include uh, both uh, uh, include uh, uh, carbon sto carbon uh, carbon storage, uh, carbon capture and storage, but uh, also carbon reuse, and um, uh, it's uh, it's a large amount. Uh, it can be up to uh, 1,000 gigaton of uh, CO2, uh, which is uh, captured or uh, for as a reuse or uh, uh, for uh, uh, for to, to, to be stored. But uh, it also uh, call upon um, uh, bioenergy CCS, which means combining. Uh, the uh, biomass, the use of biomass to produce energy with uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, this is not obvious to, to go ahead with this um, strategy because there is some competition between uh, the use for, uh, of land, uh, between energy, the use for energy for uh, BCCS and the use for uh, obviously uh, uh, needs of um, uh, food uh, this uh, is uh, also a, a clear uh, result from uh, another ipcc report on land use uh, this competition between uh, uh, energy and food uh, for the land so this uh, should be kept in mind but what is important is uh, for me is that uh, it is clear that in this scenario for um, which um, aims to keep uh, climate uh, around 1.5 degrees C with respect to pre-industrial condition, uh, there is a clear need for uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, again, with uh, also uh, part of it uh, being reused, part of it uh, being also a large part of it uh, being um, uh, combined with uh, bioenergy, uh, use of biomass for energy. Uh, where are we at the moment? It's clear that uh, it's not only uh, an IPCC report, but uh, up to now there is, I think, uh, 130 more than 130 countries around the world which has which have uh, adopted this um, uh, objective of uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. This is true for um, the United States. It's true for Europe, but many other countries, Japan. Um, uh, South Korea and Canada, uh, I think Australia, and uh, for China is 2060. But uh, so this should be taken uh, seriously because uh, it's uh, clearly uh, in the objective of uh, this country. It's also in the objective of uh, uh, our country to be uh, neutral in carbon in 2050. Uh, and so I, uh, it's important to, to think about um, uh, carbon capture and storage as a tool uh, for uh, reaching uh, this uh, objective and uh, so I uh, I would like really to to tell you that uh, the importance of uh, these two days uh, for about uh, net zero uh, uh, net zero carbon um, uh, emission and so which is a common objective and uh, uh, I uh, encourage you to go ahead with discussion this is a very serious and important topic. This being said, it is um, obviously important to limit the use of uh, uh, carbon capture and storage. And the best way to do it is uh, 
to limit emissions, to decrease emissions very rapidly. And this uh, will be necessary uh, through, uh, for example, uh, really uh, an energy mix, uh, which uh, will be uh, uh, less emitting in carbon uh, and uh, obviously uh, not at all, I mean, with uh, uh, zero emission of carbon and uh, energy mixed uh, and also sobriety in the use of energy and uh, energy efficiency. This is very important. I mean, uh, carbon capture and storage is only a complementary way uh, to uh, succeed in uh, reaching this um, carbon neutrality, but uh, obviously the best way to do it is uh, to limit uh, emissions themselves. We thank very much Jean Zouzel for his strong message. It is a scientific voice that we need to hear to address effectively climate change. Now let's uh, set the scene on three main issues. We are going to take to let the floor to three people in this way. The first issue is everything, everywhere we are connected by the climate, by the environment, by the biodiversity, by the land use, and the public earth. We have seen it recently. The second issue is also important. We need a crossing approach from countries, from companies, small and medium enterprise, and we also need much more regulation, much more decentralized applied public policy through states, through regions, through cities, and embedded also the civil society in this field. So let's come also with the theorem, but not least. How to bootstrap today a new sustainable deal? or a sustainable New Deal. It's quite the same, but how to make it in practice, like a rebirth of a public and private partnership. So we are very pleased to have and to share with you some keynotes with a great message to set the scene. And I let my co-chair introduce the first speaker for yes. this. So the first keynote will be given by Paul Frisbold, who was a recently uh, appointed EU climate ambassador. So we are very much looking forward to his speech. Thank you, Paul, for being with us this morning in live through Zoom. Thank you very much, Isabel, and thank you, Fabrice, for uh, giving me the occasion to be with you today and to listen to all the inspiring uh, speakers and to try to contribute myself with some reflections because Fabrice, I think you, you struck a very, very good tone in your opening statement when you said how should we design the future and how can we support clean tech solutions? Well, <clears throat> you know, this has been a, this has been a quite a year. In fact, I mean, it's, um, uh, we, we, we started with, uh, recently we had the report from the International Energy Agency. I am speaking to you from Norway, where I have taken refuge now in these COVID days, but I'm uh, usually also um, based in Brussels, close to the uh, EU institutions. But here in Norway, uh, we are obviously in the forefront in petroleum, in oil and gas, but also in developing low carbon technologies like carbon capture storage and biomass and carbon capture and storage, like the professor just mentioned. But the IEA report was an eye opener because it did um, set the scene and give us a very clear message. You know, um, many countries that are clinging to fossil fuel energy production has been very um, uh, grateful for the IEA's mantra, which has been that the world needs more energy. Well, after the recent net zero 2050 report of the IEA, 
That is no longer the case because the IA has said, in addition to unleashing an enormous amount of production of renewable energies, uh, that no more oil, coal, or gas fields should be opened after 2020 2021. This is a very strong message uh, and a very important message. But the thing is, you know, that the IA, uh, with its um, authority in terms of uh, competence and uh, and knowledge and information, has very little impact on the actual uh, policy design of countries and regions. There are bases for inspiration, true, but a lot more needs to be done. So the other thing that happened this year, which is of great value, not only to reaching our climate uh, mitigation targets, but also in terms of uh, creating a high price of carbon, because that will obviously be important. That is the uh, European Green Deal and the recent climate law that is being uh, adopted in these days. There was recently a, a political agreement between the EU member states, the European Parliament and the Commission on a climate law that will not only enshrine in law the goal uh, of 55% carbon uh, emission reductions by 2030, but also a trajectory towards 2050 to achieve climate neutrality in Europe, making Europe the first climate neutral continent in the world. And that law is a, is a milestone and it will have an enormous impact, um, I, I'm, I'm sure. But <clears throat> let me just say that what the EU Green Deal is trying to achieve is also more than a price mechanism. A price mechanism is, is the core of, of, of our climate policy, but we have seen the rigidity and the difficulties in making the green transition in other industries. That is why the EU Green Deal has um, a lot to offer. Now, I, I shall not go into all of them. There's a huge package that will be unleashed now on the 14th of July on the French national holiday. Um, not, not, not something specific about that, but that is the date where the Commission will present the Fit for 55, um, the legislation that will be adopted to ensure that the EU uh, countries are fit for uh, reducing climate um, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% within 2030. Um, but there is one element that I think is key here and which I think will become a very important driver um, and that is the sustainable finance project of the European Union, which is often referred as taxonomy, a terrible technical word, <laughs> um, but nevertheless, an important tool. And in, in very brief, let me just say that, you know, capital flows to where they gain the most return. Um, but the taxonomy will open up another measure for capital to, to achieve a return on investment. And this is, this is very important because if the ministers of finance and the banking and the, the finance world will receive very clear guidance and clear rules of how to measure um, return on capital, then that will make a change. Today, um, the world has many specific rules for emissions of CO2, of NOx, of other uh, dangerous substances. But the finance sector uh, has been let uh, alone. They have not been subject to the same rules. Well, the taxonomy rules will do something about that. Every investment will be measured towards how much uh, CO2 emissions it will reduce, how much any activity will lead to um, uh, adaption to climate change, how every activity will lead to a more circular economy, to reduce pollution, to um, biological um, 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 that, that we have a cleaner and we get back our nature back. Uh, and last but not least, that the seas and the oceans will become cleaner. So this will have a tremendous effect. Now, finally, 
let me just mention um, that the low carbon technologies will play a, a, a role here because as Isabel mentioned, there are some sectors that are hard to abate. There are some sectors like steel, cement, um, there is also aluminum, uh, fertilizer, etc., where um, it is difficult to uh, replace um, the molecules, the CO2 molecules with renewable energy. So we then need to use hydrogen as an energy carrier that will allow them to, uh, to reduce its carbon emissions. And that's why uh, the EU is um, in this package now proposing a way to, because Isabel mentioned it has to be economically viable. And how do we make this expensive technology today economically viable tomorrow? And so there is a mechanism uh, for a certificate trade that we hope can be the catalyst for uh, a wider implementation of this important technology. Finally, let me just say that Obviously, the US um, uh, new administration, its goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. The Chinese government is uh, also extremely important as China is the world's biggest economic driver today. And the fact that China wants to be climate neutral by 2060 is a phenomenal achievement that we should welcome. Um, and obviously, the EU carbon border tax proposal, which is very controversial, um, has already shown, I believe, to have an impact in the sense that it has uh, mobilized um, initiatives from these countries that they want to be part of this global shift of this global change. So Isabel and Fabrice, um, I just want to say, uh, um, congratulate you on an excellent initiative. I think it's uh, very timely. And it's I'm glad to see that you are bringing speakers and participants from all over the world because this is truly a global challenge and a global issue and i'm really proud to to present to you some of the key elements of what the eu is doing because i think the eu with its um, rule-based policies will be important to ensure that we get obtain the kind of changes that we have so that's all for me from now thank you back to you Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Val, for uh, setting the scene and be the introducer to make it. Uh, thanks for sharing your point of view uh, as the EU climate ambassador now and push forward the limit not only on the regulation but the practical challenges uh, on the technologies that we need. Um, so thanks a lot and yes, just keep in touch and follow the, all the conference and the session. I'm sure that uh, uh, we could uh, share a lot after the conference and very thanks a lot again. Thanks, Paul. I would like now to introduce uh, uh, another key top level speaker. Pradik, Dr. Pradik Monga, he is the former executive, Deputy Executive Secretary to Combat Desertification at UNCCD. And he is also the former Director of the Energy and Climate Change UNIDO. So we are going to have a pitch pre-registered from Pradik Monga, and he's going also to contribute to set the scene all together. So just share with you his message. Good morning, colleagues, friends. Let me begin by thanking organizers, especially Fabrice and Isabel, for inviting me to this very important global conference on the theme, Carbon Pricing for Sustainable New Deal. Friends, colleagues, this conference is happening at a very critical juncture, a critical time when all of us are preparing for very successful outcomes at COP26. We are in the midst of a climate emergency. We are in a situation in which unless and until we take urgent and collective actions on all fronts to mitigate or halt impacts of climate change and avoid potentially irreversible environmental damage resulting from it will cross that tipping point 
tipping point after which we won't be able to save ourselves, our present, our future, and of course, our planet. I am very delighted to be part of this opening session, which is focusing on three key themes, namely, everything, everyone is connected, a crossing approach is needed to address climate change, and of course, we need a sustainable New Deal if we want to move ahead now at this stage to address climate change. Let me explain all these three themes one by one. First, in my view, everything, everyone is connected everywhere. Let us reflect it in the context of ongoing COVID pandemic and of course, relationship linkages with climate change. For instance, deforestation induced by climate change, droughts, heat waves, bushfires have led to destruction of natural habitats of wildlife all around the world. Along with illegal wildlife trade has led to closer contact between humans and wildlife, resulting in zoonosis and natural situation where wildlife induced virus diseases could jump from animals, birds to humans. This is a perfect example of natural storm, a storm where climate change induced habitat loss related factors have resulted to spread of a catastrophic worldwide pandemic, COVID pandemic around the world for almost last one and a half year. Nobody is safe from COVID pandemic unless everyone is safe everywhere. And similar is true about adverse impact of climate change. Nobody will remain unaffected from climate change unless climate change is addressed every part of the world. Second, addressing climate change would need a crossing approach, an approach which means that we require integrated and holistic economic development pathways that would envisage multi-stakeholders participation, interdisciplinary approaches, governments, institutions, states, cities, regulators, businesses, and civil society all together. Civil society, including communities, NGOs at every level, global, regional, national, and local level. That is their collective action that can connect the dots and address climate change together with biodiversity loss and land degradation collectively. Sustainable New Deal would mean require going beyond discussions and pledges and getting into concrete actions, implementation of an ambitious global agenda to promote nature-based solutions, clean energy for green jobs, green habitats, green cities, green transport systems, and above all, adopting sustainable way of lifestyles that will have everlasting impact. It's time to connect globally and of course take action locally. Here, let me highlight a very important aspect that we often miss out or we do not give importance it deserves in our discussions, including this conference, in our approaches and in our actions while addressing adverse impact of climate change. And this aspect is, this missing link is, close connectivity between climate change, biodiversity, and land agenda. We try to deal with all these three issues in silos, in compartments. And this is where it becomes very complex issue. For instance, looking at land, land is foundation of all life on Mother Earth. It is a basis for supporting ecosystem services, including food, water, energy, and of course, our health. Land is also a very important economic asset and the primary source of livelihoods for almost 80% of population in the developing world. But it also, land, land is also very important, significant GAG, greenhouse gas emission sector, as well as acting as a sink. For example, after energy sector, land use sector is a significant contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. The agriculture, 
the forestry and other land uses together form the largest GIG emitting sector after energy systems accounting almost for 24% of total emissions which, which comes to around 10 to 12 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. At the same time, land also act as carbon sink. Organic soil, organic carbon store more than double the carbon, almost 2,500 100 GT gigaton plus, which is more than atmospheric at 830 gigatons and biomass 576 gigaton together. Once land get degraded, the soils get degraded, this soil organic carbon gets released back to atmosphere and that can have more further catastrophic impact on us. Land is also under unprecedented pressure from all sides in any part of human history. As I speak today, over 25% of global land is degraded due to human actions and natural factors, especially impacts induced by climate change. Over 12 million hectares of productive land, agricultural land is getting degraded every year. And if we link to our food security, we'll require, in addition to reverse the degradation, we require 300, and 300 million hectares of productive land to produce more food for the population increase if we go up to 2030. And that will have many folds increase in food production if we look at 2050 when population may touch 9 billion. Investing in land means investing in climate mitigation, climate adaptation, reversing biodiversity loss. On economic terms, investing in soil organic carbon is most economic way of carbon sequestration, acting as carbon sink, in addition to multiple impacts of food security, water conservation, and of course, ecosystem restoration. It is time that we start looking at things in holistic way. We must break these silos and start addressing climate, biodiversity, and land degradation issues together in an integrated way. And it becomes much more a norm, including this conference, wherever we discuss issues including carbon policies, carbon pricing and carbon markets to really move forward with solutions, business solutions, company solutions, government solutions to address climate change on priority. When we talk about carbon policies, we must talk about ecosystem policies. When we talk about carbon pricing, we must also talk about ecosystem service pricing. They are all interrelated. And this becomes much more important at the national level where we have different players, different actors, different policymakers dealing with the three topics together. To conclude, let me also refer to the outcomes of Dublin Climate Dialogues, a global event that was held on 19th-20th May in Dublin virtually to scale up ambition in run-up to critical COP26 summit. I have had the privilege to be associated closely with that event basically as a member of steering committee. And I was very happy to see that many important recommendations are made as part of Dublin Declaration on how to turn net zero pledges into concrete energy policies and actions on the ground. And that we need to adopt at COP26 to move forward to strengthen 2015 Paris Agreement. These recommendations, among others, included many path-breaking suggestions, pragmatic suggestions, including emphasis on renewable energy power, rapid electrification of global economy, where solar and wind will play a very important role, phasing out of fossil fuels, decommodization of energy systems, rapid introduction of global reporting and accounting measures to best reflect the potential impact of climate risk to countries, communities, and of course to companies. Delivery of public policy pathways that will enable countries to accelerate their transition to net zero by 2050 or even earlier. And of course, a solid commitment to enable cross-border solutions, including putting a strong price on carbon. And that's where this conference comes in. The introduction of national and international carbon price floors and other mechanisms which become very relevant 
as business models. While closing, let me once again emphasize the fact that addressing climate change effectively would require an integrated approach, including renewed focus on policy, financial, and of course, capacity building incentives, actions to connect the dots. We need to address climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation collectively to address them on all fronts. It is about us, about our health, about our lives, our jobs, and most importantly, our ecosystems, our life support ecosystems that on which we depend for our survival and of course, survival of our planet itself. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Very impactful, very interesting, uh, Dr. Pradeep Manga, to contribute, set the scene with all the top level speaker. Uh, you have highlighted so much and to put on the table the hard things that everything on the front and surely on the background are connected much more deeper than we think, usually daily. And the importance of the natural carbon thing to preserve, that is the way, the, the new pathway to uh, land using uh, to our own, based on our own activities, economic activities and their impact. And it's very interesting that you introduce, in fact, the link and the connection yeah. to the biodiversity, which is the, not the new one, but as the COP26 is going to run in the next November in Glasgow, there is an amazing synchronization on COP15 uh, and Cuming dedicated on biodiversity. So, by this way, we are going to follow up by a new speaker who is going to better design this issue on the biodiversity. As you said, Dr. Pradeep Manga, when we talk about climate and carbon issues, we have also to talk about the carbon footprint or the biodiversity footprint. So, for this, we are pleased to welcome Antoine Vallier. Antoine Vallier, he is an expert of biodiversity footprint. So, uh, Antoine Vallier, uh, who is going to contribute on his field uh, based on uh, the Caisse de Depot and Consignation, the biodiversity branch. Hello, everyone. Even a few years ago, it would have been difficult to talk about biodiversity during a conference about climate. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I think it's a very good sign that it's being more and more understood that climate change and biodiversity loss uh, are two topics deeply interrelated. Maybe before I get to that point, uh, I will start with the definition of biodiversity. The Convention on Biological Bi Diversity defines it as the viability among living organisms from all sources, including interalia, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complexes of which are part. This includes diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. So the last part of this definition clearly distinguishes three dimensions uh, for biodiversity, the species, the ecosystems, and the genes. Most of the time when people think about biodiversity, they think about the first dimension. They think about the species. They think about pandas, bears, whales, all those emblematic species that uh, often, unfortunately, are now endangered. Obviously, it is a very important dimension. But if you limit biodiversity to it, it might also be misleading. You might not be able to fully grasp what is at stake when we talk about biodiversity erosion. To fully understand what is at stake, you actually have to understand, to consider the second dimension of biodiversity, the ecosystems. The ecosystems are the functional entities of nature. They are the results of uh, millions of years of evolution, and they provide essential services to humans. Maybe the best illustration of the services they provide is food production. Without the billions of insects working every day for free, we wouldn't be able to produce food because we wouldn't be able to pollinate plants. 
Another great service, and I get to my first point, is climate regulation. The biggest thing, sink of carbon today are the natural ones, forests, oceans, soils. Without those, uh, climate change would go much, much, much faster. And it works the other way around. Uh, climate change is also uh, may a big contributor for climate for biodiversity loss. It's uh, and it will probably contribute more and more. When temperature rises by one or two degrees within one or two century, local species simply don't have enough time to adapt. So they perish, and we experience a transition phase which can last thousands of years, where it will, that's the time that it will take for, for new species to appear, to, to colonize uh, those ecosystems with new living conditions. So thousands of years might not be such a long time when you're relatively to the, the, the planet um, lifespan, but for humanity, it will be a long way to go with degraded ecosystems and degraded ecosystem services that they provide. So it's really important to understand that uh, you have a positive correlation uh, between uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. Recently, uh, a study showed that uh, Amazon forest, the biggest uh, terrestrial sink of carbon, uh, was actually probably a net contributor for carbon emissions during the past decades. And this is a very strong signal because it means that we actually are starting to 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 lose to to lose the, the, the natural breaks that we have so far on climate change and that we could experience uh, an acceleration of of the process and we have to act quickly otherwise this acceleration will will quickly get us to a point of uh, of no return another service that uh, nature provides is uh, health we know that uh, Living uh, among healthy ecosystems provides many things uh, that are essential to health. Clean water, unpolluted air, food of good quality. Also, biodiversity is a great inspiration for, for medicine. Most of the molecules we, we today use are inspired by nature. Um, and there are many more to be discovered that could be pot potential medicine for existing diseases or, or new diseases. And here again, it works the other way around. The, the more we destroy biodiversity, also the more we um, get into contact to, to new diseases. Uh, that's one of the message that uh, has been raising with uh, the recent pandemic is that actually the fact that we're destroying natural habitats uh, get us closer to, to new diseases, new viruses. And this is part of the explanation why we have a, a frequency of uh, large spread diseases, which is uh, increasing uh, more and more. So the key message here is that health, climate change, biodiversity are all part of the same problem. You cannot solve one without solving the others. And the key, is the way to success is uh, a unified approach. So I think it's very interesting that we uh, managed to uh, talk about climate and biodiversity uh, in this conference. I think it's very important as, uh, as investors to, to, to understand that the, those physical risks, uh, the dependencies we, we have on, on nature are, are material and that the, those risks uh, are getting more and more important. It's probably also important to uh, understand that the related regulatory risks are getting more and more material. Uh, we are starting to see central banks actually trying to evaluate uh, the biodiversity risk because they understand that actually uh, it can uh, the biodiversity loss can actually uh, be a source of uh, 
of um, is of instability for the financial systems. Last week uh, in France, uh, a new law uh, was published uh, on ESG reporting, and investors are now asked to uh, report on their risk risk related to biodiversity and they have to clearly distinguish the the risk linked to their impacts and their least the risk linked to their dependencies so regulatory risk is now a material as well so it's time to act i think uh, we have the right knowledge we have the right tools to do it. Uh, on an optimistic note, uh, I would uh, I would say that uh, nature is very resilient, um, that we know that if uh, we don't reach a certain tipping point, uh, we will be able, uh, we will, nature can bounce back quickly. And uh, so which means that uh, if we act quickly, we will also uh, see the results quickly, which I think is, uh, is very encouraging. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Antoine uh, Valier, for sharing your point of view for this in your institutional uh, representative as you are and talking on the importance of the biodiversity linked to carbon issue. So we are going to run now uh, the first one series session dedicated to the name title of Carbon Pricing Conference, uh, the carbon issue. But before it, we are going to uh, just share with you this. <laughs>